clearly you made an impact because we have drawn a crowd. Chatting with us today is Jaron Lanier. <laughs> Jaron was a key figure in the creation of virtual reality as a concept, as a technology. He's also widely regarded as a visionary in this area of technology. We are so excited to talk with you today. Well, thanks for having me here. Can you yeah. tell us a little bit about your background before we dive oh, into God. this? I mean, how did you how did you become the guy who, well, I, who, who was at the forefront of I've this? I've had kind of a weird life. And okay. I think, uh, if it's okay, can I mention, I, I wrote a book called Dawn of the New Everything, which is a memoir which explains a bit of it. But um, roughly speaking, I'm a computer scientist. I've worked with all kinds of people and done all kinds of things. I've had startups. Um, I've, uh, I, I did kind of start the virtual reality field, um, oddly enough, and uh, I've, um, my friends and I sold an AI company to Google, and I've, I've been working with Microsoft quite a lot on, on stuff, and uh, I've, um, uh, one of my old companies is now part of Pfizer, and another one became part of Adobe. Uh, so I've been a serial entrepreneur, but that was a long time ago. And I write books, and I, uh, uh, I ha I'm considered, I think, a little bit of a radical because I always try to find this humanistic approach to computer science. I sort of believe the machines don't mean a thing. They're barely even there without us. So I have, I have a particular humanistic approach to understanding technology. Well, I think that probably makes you a very good fit for credit unions that are so human focused. Well, that's what I think. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. All right. Take me back a second. And I... I have an English degree, so some of my questions may be a little basic, but explain, <laughs> explain to me the difference between... English is a good language. I, I think so. <laughs> I mean, like, what? <laughs> explain to, to me and to all of us uh -huh. the difference between virtual reality and artificial intelligence. Oh. <laughs> there have been a lot of jokes about that over the years. Uh, I mean, what I used to say, so my, my old mentor when I was young was Marvin Minsky, uh, who is probably the single most in influential figure in the history of artificial intelligence. And I always used to joke with him that the difference between virtual reality and artificial intelligence is virtual reality is when the computer scientist lets you know that you're being fooled. <laughs> <laughs> in other words, there's a lot of theatrics in computer science, and there's a lot of, so whenever you see an artificial intelligent thing, it's not so much there's some raw absolute capability that demonstrates we've mastered part of what the human brain does. Although once in a while there's a little bit of that, but there's always um, a larger component, which is this theatrical element where we frame it and we have storytelling and we have a user interface and a presentation and an economic story and a structure and a whole, a whole thing that kind of sells it. You know, and uh, we do exactly the same thing. Virtual reality is totally fake, except of course it is. That's the whole point. So I feel like we're sort of, it's the difference between uh, a stage magi magician is a virtual reality scientist. A stage magician says, I'm about to fool you. Here, I fooled you. Wasn't that wonderful? Whereas AI is kind of sneakier. They're kind of like the, the, the trickster out in the audience. That, yeah. makes, that makes total sense. <laughs> and, and many people are very bullish on AI and the future. How, how do you see the future of this technology? Well, AI, I mean, like, so I'm a little, I wouldn't say I'm cynical about it. I feel like I'm a realist about AI, which is, I mean, I remember in the old days with Marvin, I used to say, but this is just a storytelling about software. All you just mean is software. We could call anything AI, right? And he was like, we're gonna get a lot of money out of DARPA with this story, so just play along, you know? <laughs> and I kind of feel like, to some degree, it is a theatrical way of presenting computer science, and um, I don't think theatrics are going away, so I think AI has a bright future. But we have to understand that it's like, what we call AI is mostly theatrics, a little bit science, and kind of a lot um, culture. A lot of it is just the type of interaction with computers that people decide to accept. Um, and so if we understand AI for what it really is, which is, I, I believe I've described it honestly, then yeah, sure, there's going to be a lot of it. Uh, on, our, on our main stage, you talked about AI and its tendency to want to fool people or to be in there and to be a little bit sneaky. Uh -huh. And I think 
as we think about credit unions, especially in the context of other financial institutions, that's not what credit unions are about. How, how do you, how do you yeah. put those things together? Okay, well, let me give you an example that I find is a pretty good starting one. It's actually not a perfect example, but there's no such thing as a perfect example. But let me, uh, here it is. Um, one of the marvels of what we call AI is that it can translate between languages. Right. You can look at a web page that's in Chinese and see it in English, and it's readable. Mm -hmm. But how does that happen? The way it happens is that the services that translate between languages have to scrape, is the term, but we could call it steal, uh, millions, tens of millions of examples from real life translators every single day in order to keep up with memes and pop culture and, and news and slang and all that stuff, because it changes every single day. At the same time, those translators are seeing this incredible deflation of their career prospects. Uh, there's a small number of them who have adapted well, but overall the field has shrunk to something like a tenth of what it was. I was in Japan a couple of weeks ago, and on my phone I had a, I had a tool where I could just put it up against any piece of writing and it would translate it into English. Right, and which is wonderful, right? Yeah. So I have no objection to that existing in the world. I only wish it had been around when I was young and I visited Japan. It would, it's marvelous. I was knowing what I was eating, which was a really good thing. Sometimes it's a good thing. Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes, okay, so. <laughs> They offered I, I, me horse sashimi, I'm just saying. I did not eat that. I was in Korea and they offered me whale sashimi and I was oh. like, okay, no, this no. is like, I'm not going there. No, we digress, We however. do digress, okay. All right, so the, the key here is that the people who are providing the example data that make the system work are being told that they're being made obsolete and they're seeing their careers go down the tubes because this thing is replacing them, except it's a lie because in fact they're still needed because their data is needed. And so, um, so if you look at the big picture, what's going on is that in order to support the fantasy of some kind of pure AI or kind of freestanding AI, we're telling the people that supply the absolutely necessary data that they're not needed, right? That's part of the fantasy. And in doing that, we're going to create future employment crises. We're going to create some kind of bizarre centralized basic income powerhouse that'll run everything and will probably get corrupted because that's what always happens with communist experiments. Um, but what, there's another alternative, which is we could be honest and we could say, hey, the people who are providing the data that's needed by these new tools are in fact valuable because they're needed. Let's pay them and create a new kind of market. And so what I would suggest is A, the average credit union probably has members who are more vulnerable to this process of being told they're not valuable when in fact they are than a lot of other institutions. And the reason I say that is if you look at the people who are being sort of automated out of existence, a lot of them are exactly the people who are applying some kind of intuition or problem solving ability. Uh, nurses are an example, but there are many, many others. So what I'm thinking is, as these people are being told they're not needed as much, or as they're being asked to go into some kind of gig economy, which is a race to the bottom where they get no job security, and they're all competing against each other, and there's no way to plan a life, as they're being told that, if we can create the mechanism where they could also be paid for their data, then they can agitate for it. And so that leads me to ask a very simple question. What institution possibly exists in the world that has a financial connection to tens of millions of people who are in this category who might want to be paid that could create that mechanism like that, relatively speaking, and the answer is credit unions. Working together. Working together, but they already work together for ATMs and so forth, right? Yeah. So that's already accomplished. So it just seems to me that without knowing the details, and I'm sure there's a world of regulation and God knows what that I don't know about, but just the basic setup of the situation would seem to be that credit unions would be an ideal mechanism for getting us out of this bizarre dilemma where the fantasy of AI is making people's livelihoods less secure for no particular reason. We should enjoy the benefits that the software can bring to us, whether you call it AI or whatever, I think translation software is great. I've worked on it. It's wonderful. However, 
we should also not tell people they're no longer needed. We should not tell people they no longer deserve uh, to earn their living. We should not tell people that they've lost that dignity of being special and important be just because they're contributing in a new way instead of the old way. You are, um, you are such a big thinker that I, I want to see if we can follow this logic a little bit more or this story a little further down the road. Sure. If we're envisioning this world where credit unions are enabling people to be paid for their data, what's the first step in making that happen? <clears throat> well, I don't know the world of credit unions well enough in detail to be um, a strategic planner for credit unions. I mean, let's just admit that right at the start. But it seems to me that when I've been in like a thousand meetings with tech companies where they're saying, oh, if only we could get more people to sign up, and if only they'd sign up with actual financial institution data so that we could have transactions with them. And very few companies have achieved that. So uh, Amazon has. Facebook has zillions of people signed up, but not with the financial connection. Correct. Apple has uh, in a certain slice of the world, yeah. mostly, mostly in just certain countries. Um, who else? There's a few, but not too many. So just American credit unions have something like 60 million people. They already, the, the different credit unions are already cooperating enough to make ATMs interoperable. They kind of already have this thing. Like just all of those accounts and those relationships viewed as a resource are unquestionably the most valuable asset from like a Sil Silicon Valley mindset, far, far, far outpacing any other possible assets that credit unions have. If, if credit unions collectively were like some Silicon Valley company, they'd be like the most valuable one because of that. It, it's extraordinary. Or at, least, or at least they'd be like in the very, very top tier. And so it just seems to me there's this very, I'm, I haven't answered your question, I'm sorry. No, but I, I'm, I'm sort going of off. I, no, it's okay. I remember, I won't forget it, but so, so <laughs> you, I um, interrupt my digression, but I will answer you. I, no, I'm putting the pieces together in my head. Uh -huh. And if with a one click sign on or however you're describing it, I, I, I think I understand it. It's almost as if if credit unions are gathering the revenues from this data, then it, it goes back to the members as a dividend. Right, so there's, there's an interesting thing that's happened, which is companies like Amazon and Facebook and so on have an extraordinary amount of information about people. They have an extraordinary ability to influence people. Um, Clearly. But they don't have any fiducial relationship. They don't have a responsibility towards those people. So for instance, Amazon is free to charge different people different amounts for the same thing because they can calculate that they can, they can you know. Alexa is doing that too. Oh, Alexa. I, I just cannot believe people would have their kids talking to one of these things. That just like blows my mind. But let's leave that aside for a second. I mean, do you remember the movie, you're too young, but there's a movie called 2001 A Space Odyssey. Um, I have heard of it, I've not seen it. Well, But I'm not too young, what, but thank you. <laughs> <laughs> you, you. I think you are actually, uh, I, but it, it came out when I was a kid in the 60s and there's this round thing that talks and it's on the wall and it's called HAL, this computer, yeah. and it it's murders some of these astronauts and it's it, you talk to it and it does what you want, but it actually is this horrible thing and they have to kill it. And, um, and what, what's amazing is that now everybody wants these round things that you talk to, and it, it's almost like no amount of warning in science fiction is good enough to reach people. I just, I don't, I don't, but anyway, but Amazon's single most valuable asset is probably just how hard it is to sign on and create new accounts elsewhere, and also Facebook's. Like, as soon as you've just gone through the trouble of entering your damn credit card and doing, you know, entering the, like, you, you can only spend so many hours a day entering numbers and yeah. letters, right, into a computer. Computer. And then, then you can just sign on to the thing, you have that one click and there you are. Well, what I'm thinking is uh, credit union members could collectively have a service like that and they could just go to everybody else who isn't Amazon or Facebook and say, hey, here's a sign on, a one, a one, a one step sign on that our mem you'll suddenly get all these people who are already there. And that would be like, everybody would want to work with you on that. That would be incredible. And then suddenly people would have a place to turn online that's there on their side, which currently does not exist. Amazing. I think it would be just amazing. It would be an incredible win-win for everybody. Um, we are running out of time, so I want to just ask a couple of wrap-up kind of questions. Okay. A few years back, you asked who owns the future? 
How would you answer this question today? Ah, well, uh, that was a book five or six years ago now um, that I wish had been totally wrong, but unfortunately turned out to be somewhat prescient. <laughs> and uh, what a bummer. Uh, I, no, I mean, no, I mean, like you want to, if you write something that's like uh, negative, you want to be wrong, right? And that one, well, anyway, so who owns the future? Right now, whoever owns the biggest computer owns the future. And what should happen instead is anyone who provides good data that makes the world better should own the future. There should be a distribution of reward based on what people contribute instead of total benefit to whoever owns the central hub and can calculate everybody else, you know, more than they can calculate themselves. And. Finally, yes. how would you like to experience financial services 10 years from now? Oh, my. Um, well, for one thing, I think the very most important thing to me is to work with parties who I think are really on my side credit union member, myself. And, and that's not that common in Silicon Valley, but I've seen these, you know. I've seen enough shenanigans in, in banks that I am pretty convinced that <laughs> they can they can be trouble. And uh, so I think that I think a sense of trust is is number one. A sense of simplicity. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> um, I think one of the the huge problems is not only the overwhelming complexity of decisions that people face, but the way that complexity is actually leveraged to control people. The fact that. I mean, part of what's going on with, the, with say, healthcare spending is that it's just so complicated that nobody can understand anything, so it's humanly impossible to unravel. Uh, that's what's, what happened with the mortgage-backed security uh, yep. crisis. And I think that that's happening on every level. People, a lot, the people with the biggest computers realize that anybody with a smaller computer can't understand what they're doing, so there tends to be a lot of complexity radiated out towards people. And it's a new form of control. And what I want is I want to work with people who don't seek that type of control. Sounds good to me, Jaron. Thank you so much for doing this with us oh, today. Sure. <laughs> and, and